Oh, man. Hi, everybody. I didn't know it was on, and I was like, oh, man. I <laughs> washed my hair today because my hair is just a whole situation. And um, I don't know. Shannon, what do you think? Is it better? I think it might not be better. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I don't know what to do, Shan. <laughs> I need a person. We are happy to be here today and on, and as we have been for, this is our fourth day. Thank you, babe. Um, and we are going to have a very good friend of mine. I, you know, I bring people in and I keep them forever and ever. And uh, Stephen Dakili is with us. I murder his last name all the time. Stephen Dakili, Dakili, Dakili. He'll tell us and share his story, his journey, his experience um, as a dad. And I think that this is going to be massive and I think it's going to create a shift. So with no further ado, let me find my Stephen and have him come in. And Where are you, Stephen? Wave at me again. Up oh, there. Okay, I'm getting you. I don't know what to do with this. If anyone's a hairdresser in New Jersey, Stephen, I'm talking about my hair. <laughs> What's up? Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. You're doing better. Look at your beautiful day. Oh, uh, enjoying some sunshine that we never get in Pittsburgh, but oh, today man. is beautiful. Cold but sunny. Yeah, it is chilly, isn't it? Yep. If I go outside, or all you hear here is garbage trucks backing up the whole time so we'll just deal with the dogs here garbage truck we'll we'll wing it who knows maybe one will come i know <laughs> so um first of all i say your last name three different ways and i i feel like i've known you my whole life so say your last name for me d achille oh i gotta put an i in there d achille yes like achilles <laughs> my achilles you? heel is saying yes. d achille uh -huh. um, so I just said that you were coming on and you were going to be our, our lone man. You're the, you're the solo man. You're always so special. I'm used to it. I'm used to it by now. We surround well, you. We're going to get worry. more. We're going to recruit more. That's what I want to say. I think dads want to get more involved. We just need like an instruction manual. Yep. So we're going to so, write that. Oh, look now my moms are telling me to take my gum out. Hold on. <laughs> Such a motherly thing. To if do. I didn't have all these people, what would I do? Right. Um, you're a little pixelated. Is there a better spot in your yard so we could see your handsome face? Um, let me see here. Shadows? Is it not? No, on? no. It's just like pixie. Um, let me see here. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, good. Look, we have two husbands watching. There we go. Yep. Yep. Allison, why can't I remember? Is it Matt or Chris? And uh, Allison's interesting. I, I, I hope she shares her, her um, commonality with you. Does this work? A little bit better. A little bit. Actually, it's getting better. Wait, it got better. It did get better? Yeah. All right, hold on. Matt, right. I'm, I'm talking to Allison. Uh, there you are. All right. There you are. So um, this is Stephen, and uh, we met years ago. We only meet at three places in this world, right? As of now, we meet at Mom Congress. Yep. Or we meet at the PSI, or we right. meet... Maybe we only meet at two places. We meet at two places, right? Oh no, we met at AHN. Remember when we wrapped yeah, my wish for moms? Yes. There we go. So why don't you just tell um, a little bit about who you are, and then we'll just chat because you and I can go for hours. Right. Okay. So my name is Stephen D. Achille. I am the president and founder of the Alexis Joy D. Achille Foundation for Postpartum Depression. Um, the foundation came about in 2013 after uh, my wife lost her battle with postpartum depression. My daughter was five and a half weeks old um, when my wife ultimately uh, took her life. She, you know, was the 
the woman that this could never happen to. She had everything going for her. She had, you know, access to, you know, whatever. But uh, I guess she was, she, she was like every, how many doctors did you call after she had the baby? And how many doctors said to you, she looks good. She's not, she's okay. Right. When so you then, knew you know, at that time in 2013, it was, um, you know, Adrian was born August 30th. Uh, the first two weeks were, you know, she kind of held it together because her mother was in town from Jersey visiting uh, and helping out. And when she left, things spiraled out of control really quickly. And it's important to note, too, that, you know, everything kind of started. The pregnancy was perfect. We didn't have any of the the, the troubles that a lot of people. Oh, you got stopped was you know we were lucky we got pregnant the first time we tried and i uh, actually weren't even trying it was just an accident but um i think it's important for people to understand that you know perinatal mental health issues um are not just postpartum depression it's people that i have so many friends that su suffer with infertility that suffer with um losing babies stillborn babies um that suffer with making decisions because they find out you know, something is wrong with the baby while mom's still, ca you know, carrying and, and then planning that course, you know, for the rest of the pregnancy or for the rest of the child's life. And, um, and so it's just, been, it's just crazy when you think about how many people are affected by this. And then you also, as a dad, uh, you know, and what we see with our facility is we help women. But what happens when women don't get the help they need right. is... Oftentimes, they're in treatment getting better, and just as they're getting better, their husbands need help. They end up having mental health issues. And so that's why I always like to say that this is a family health issue. Me too. Because when yeah. mom's sick, everybody feels the ripple, and everybody ends up sick. And, and the most sad of all is, you know, I, children pay the ultimate price for it. So that's why the work that you do, I do, and, and that everyone in this area does is so important, because it really is family health um, yep. and it helps have healthy families and then we watch our children grow up to be healthy awesome uh human beings hopefully so but my wife's story started um and my journey started we were blessed and we had a perfect pregnancy she she barely even had any kind of morning sickness or anything she was you know flawless pregnancy up until the day of delivery and she had a traumatic uh code blue delivery with our daughter and it you know, it was, she, my daughter was a, a week and a day late. We went to the hospital that day. They sent us home. And later that day, we went back. And there was just, a, you know, one doctor in the OB practice that we chose that for some reason, it just, she just didn't gel with my wife. And unfortunately, that was the doctor that was on call the day that, you know, she went into labor. And I remember you know, sitting in the room um, completely, I think that's the biggest problems around fatherhood is that we are left out of the pregnancy. We have, we play no role during pregnancy out, outside of making a baby. We don't do much. And that in society doesn't expect us to do much. And in fact, exactly. that's why, uh, so many doctors, so many OBs, so many um, pediatricians that say it's abnormal. It's almost awkward when, when, fathers come to the appointments with mom and over the last six and a half years doing this kind of work it kind of struck me especially this year that i think the quickest fix is is to focus on dads yep. and how we can be better supports better husbands better fathers and better supports because we have this 40 week window which in actual actuality is 10 months yep. to start conversations to to not just tell moms we love them and support them but to show it to them and, and to be uh, expected, just like what you said. It should like, be expected. It, yep. needs to be it shouldn't norm. be like, bro, and I bro. Think outcomes will be so much better. And so, you know, it shouldn't be awkward when dads come to doctor's appointments. Yeah. And I think it's 10 weeks, you know, looking back now at me trying to help my wife, had I had relationships with the OB team yeah. and knew these doctors and could call and say, hey, doctor, so and so, like, something's off with my wife. Because women can hide from the rest of the world, but you can't hide from the people that love you most. You know, so good. no one yep. knows where to go. So I think starting these conversations early, participating during pregnancy, establishing relationships with doctors, 
will be an, an immense help towards women and just I think them feeling that support um, will give a lot of women the courage they need to, to say something's wrong. And we'll um, also let the other person, I mean, if one out of five women get this, say 800,000, I mean, Stephen, right? We said how many times that, that means 800,000 men and partners. And we're ignoring that whole other number when the well, infrastructure is already there. I, I always say we're 50% of 100% of the problem. <laughs> Without us, it's not happening. They're not in this boat. And so, yep. you know, the least we can do, considering you're carrying the baby and, and, and giving birth to a child, is I think we need to arm ourselves to be the best advocates we can be. Even in the delivery room, you know, our, our doctor came in and said, there is a multiple birth next door and a high-risk birth. After that, you're third in line, and I'm the only OB here. And um, so you can do this your way or my way. You can oh. push now. You're a first-time mother. This baby's not coming for at least two more hours. You can do it your way and push now and not have the energy you need two hours from now. Or you can save your energy and push when I can get back here in two hours. Either way, I don't care. And she turned away, and she walked out the door. And as soon as she walked out the That's door, disgusting. She, she started pushing and it was one nurse and myself each one of us were holding one leg and 12 minutes later, he's reconnecting he's because, reconnecting uh, the umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck multiple times and so she couldn't come out and it turned from you know you you have this picture in your mind of what it's going to be like especially when your first child comes into the world and i think that picture in reality, should be placed with like a, a war scene where someone's like torso is blown in half by a grenade or something. <laughs> and then on top of that, the sheer <laughs> of not have, I mean, that's the truth. I know. Oh, time. I know. I'm a labor and delivery and nurse. And so like, I wish I knew as a dad what I was getting ready to witness. And I also think women need to know what they're really in for here. And, and so, you know, Long story short, it was a code blue delivery. It went from there being no doctor to it seemed like at least a dozen doctors. And they rushed to whoever's life was in danger, which at that time was my daughter's and myself included. I rushed to her. And I remember looking back at my wife. She's sitting in the bed and it was like just this glaze over her eyes. And she was so terrified. Yeah. And it was like there was nothing left behind them. And I stayed at the hospital every night uh, until we went home. And, you know, my daughter, you know, she was blue, which I think most people, babies are when they're first born. But my, my wife really believed once we got her home that, like, her, she just could not get over the fact that her very first act of motherhood was harming and damaging her child. And she truly believed that our daughter had um, brain damage because she couldn't hold her in for two hours for the doctor to be in the room. And so that led to neurological testing on our daughter when she was about two weeks old. Even when we got the test for that, um, and it was like, she's fine. Yeah. She's just refused to believe it. And she would analyze everything. Why does she hold her thumbs in her hands like this? Why does she only look over her left shoulder or her right shoulder? Um, and, and like, she's definitely got to be damaged. And I damaged her. And <sighs> so things were pretty bad. And Oh, Stephen. At about two weeks and, and multiple calls to the OB practice, um, we were told that they had a psychologist, uh, which I learned later, I don't know if it was my perception that it was a psychologist, but we went back to the hospital where we delivered and it was in the evening after hours. And this woman was, you know, really concerned with, with Alexis and her mental state. And we went down to the city and we went there was like nobody on the floor it was really bizarre. And there was one woman and, and she was an LCSW and licensed for people that don't know, licensed clinical social worker. And we sat and we talked to her and she had a daughter in another city that was going through the same thing, had delivered around the, the same week, I believe as you know, our daughter. And she it was the first time that we ever heard that Alexis was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder from the delivery. And that was kind of a hard pill to swallow because then she knew something was wrong with her. But at the same time, she also knew that I was just going to say something. Yeah. And so that meeting was really a, a meeting of, for me, an eye opener that there was a much bigger problem than there was, but there was still not really mention of 
postpartum depression. So I was just going to say, when so you meet someone who finally says a word or a phrase that gives you a name to a a a, a feeling that you're you're seeing. But does she offer you help or resources or anything? What? What she offered was coping mechanisms for the anxiety. And this was kind of the start of the anxiety. And, you know, and her anxiety was so bad that, like, she would just, she would grab her throat like this. And when you would talk to her, she would slowly back away from you. And she was literally suffocating. And so, she, so we left with exercises, one of which was, you know, count from 100 to zero backwards in intervals of seven. Oh, I hate that. And it was like... That's like a math for professor. For somebody with really bad anxiety. Yeah. That we're, we're, we're like... And I think the one thing about anxiety, like real anxiety that people don't understand is the most natural thing for human beings is breathing. You yeah. don't even have to be conscious to do it. Yeah. But breathing is hard when you have that kind of anxiety. Decision-making is impossible. And so, you know, she's like, oh man, I, like, I, there's no way I can count. Like, what the heck's that gonna do for me? Again, it's and, setting and, her up. And the other thing was to take a, a warm shower as hot, you know, as hot as you can possibly handle and, it, it, and then bend down and hold your ankles and let the water run down your back as long as possible. Like, hmm. you just, she just delivered a child. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how the hell is she supposed to grab her ankles and, you know. Or not just, pass out. It was just like, it was just, you know, looking back, it's like, how is this as good as it yeah. gets? Um, this is what we do to treat anxiety and, and, and PTSD. <sighs> and then the lastly, and the thing that actually was most effective for her was to just, if you have access to ice, just put ice in your hands and hold it. And it kind of just shocks you back. And that was, you know, I would say for anyone having anxiety or about to have a panic attack, that's probably the most practical thing to do. Yeah. And, and so, but that's what we left with. And so no people, no parents, referrals, no one to she, talk to. Right. And so, but she, and then she was so concerned with my wife that every day, every morning she would call my wife, check in on her, see what was happening. And that was sort of from two weeks till five and a half weeks when she took her life. That's how every day started with my wife on the phone with her or crying at the foot of the bed, having um, multiple panic and anxiety attacks um, on the floor in the closet, crying, um, you know, and, and so she is a kind of a unique case in that she she never had a single hit, mental health issue her entire life was totally stable always was an overachiever and successful in everything she did. She was the one that everyone wanted to work with at her company or every job she ever had. Um, graduated with a 4.0 from her master's program. Uh, you know, she was, I mean, she actually was the breadwinner at the time. She, she, was, she was the best at everything she did. Um, nobody took care of a house like her. She could not go to bed with dishes in the sink. She, the bed was made every day, everything. And, and I think that pressure of, I was you know, just going to say, perfect, she was a perfectionist. Yeah, perfect mom, perfect appearance, perfect everything. Yep. Then this baby comes and just throws you for a loop. And you, you, I don't care how good your baby is, it's hard. You, you know, you, and babies don't, but she was also used to positive reinforcement, getting a raise for her work, getting, you know, accolades for her work, doing, and, and babies don't do that. And, so, and they don't sleep. And they don't sleep. And she was very regimented. She had her routine every night. And she would, you know, her skincare routine, her everything was like, uh, you know, uh, and I miss seeing, you know, those routines, because I'm the opposite. I have no structure. <laughs> and, and, and so she kept me balanced and, and herself and a baby. And, and, you know, so I think that's, you know, I think that's, a, you know, kind of dad's job are doing a good job. And, and So, well, anyway, so. But also too, right? It has to start like from someone who has a title, who is going to say to a type A perfectionist woman, you know, it's going to be so imperfect. Like it, you know, at visit one or again at month five or in a childbirth class and, you know, and pull you in and say, what are you going to look for? Because you didn't have any tools. You had no idea. 
I had no clue. And and we did the baby classes and I could swaddle a baby. And I mean, all the classes that they offer are useless, totally useless. Um, and they never but, said anything. They never said anything about this. The only thing I ever heard was like baby blues, baby blues. And, and, and so, you know, it was actually her realizing she was in trouble before me and she was trying to find help. And she was trying to force her to, you know, to do different yoga stuff that she could do or go for a walk or you know, she knew she was in trouble and she desperately fought it. And she, you know, she was the type of person that stuck up for everyone. Like she, if she thought something was right, she stood behind it. If she thought something, something was wrong, she went after it and she let them know it was wrong. And so she knew something was wrong and she was calling her OBs, her the pediatrician. I mean, every doctor that she, throughout the whole pregnancy that had anything to do with anything, she was letting them know, I am not okay. Something bad's going to happen. And it was only after she passed that I was able to read some of her screening things. And it was absolutely horrifying what she wrote down on those. And, and the doctors never read them. They never did anything because they don't get paid. So you're talking anything. about like the Edinburgh screening tool. So people were yes. doing it and she was being truthful right and then and, and, and actually our 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 um pediatrician is a good friend of my mom's and she after alexa at the, i think it was like a funeral she just she was just crying and she was saying i wanted to tell you so bad what was going on but because of hip i couldn't and i'm going what what kind of world do we live in when a woman is saying she's going to kill herself and you know the husband and the family, and you don't say anything because of HIPAA. And you tell me, you tell me this at the funeral, and <laughs> and so you know it was it was steady appointments with it was seven hospitals in our last thirteen days. We spent our fourth wedding anniversary at an emergency psych ward in in Pittsburgh, and she looked beautiful. I can I still remember what she was wearing and. You know, and she she spoke. So everyone always said she should be a news, you know, news anchor because she was she spoke perfectly and she had perfect teeth and a perfect mouth. And she was easy on the eyes and she was just and so she would be in the appointments and they would be talking to her. And, and, at, and this specific night on our anniversary, we get to the ER and it was like. We checked in and they're like, what are you here for? And she's like, I'm having really, you know, horrible thoughts and harming harming myself i have a you know uh i probably at that time a three and a half week old, no it was a five no, weeks be five weeks that yeah. was october 3rd it was five days before she she passed and um she said that you know i i just i just can't handle this anymore i just don't know any way out like i and and so they kept switching us from floor to floor and it was hours before we finally got to a glass room that locked from the outside and it was during that time that, you know, it was a couple hours we were in there and she kept begging to go on the other side of the glass, not to the waiting room to be like admitted. And the doctor just kept saying, you're not like them. You don't belong back there. You're not crazy. You're not this. You're not that. And because she was put together saying, right. I just don't know how to make it stop. I can't get out of my mind. I have to make this anxiety stop. But she I'm looked crazy. Okay. I feel crazy. I'm losing my mind. But her hair was done. Her she didn't need makeup, but she and it was our anniversary. So she and she was crying, crying, crying because I came home with a gift and and, and these beautiful flowers. And she kept saying, "I don't deserve this. Oh, Steve. I don't deserve. You. You're gonna lose me. Uh, you're gonna leave me. And you're gonna take the baby because I'm crazy and I'm never gonna get better. And I, I'm such a horrible wife. I can't even put a dress and heels on you for and go to town for dinner for our, for our anniversary. And I was saying, I don't care about that. Like, and so I just made this big thing up and I said, you know, well, we're going to town. And then we got <laughs> in the car and it was like, I said, just put something comfortable on And She used to have these, these gold flats that I got her that she loved. And so she put them on and she put this coat I bought her on and these little, she always had these, um, what kind of jeans were they? Uh, she always wore, I forget the brand, but, and, uh, she, you know, she put all the stuff, she would always wear things that I bought for her. So she put all things on that I bought her and we went and I said, well, we're going to the psych ward. And I was always tasked with choosing this three inpatient emergency, you know, psych units in Pittsburgh. And I was always told 
you know, I was always choosing the lesser of three evils, what I thought was the safest, right. the less stigma around it. And so I took her to one that night and, and, and she was happy to go. She wanted to go. And, but I remember when they said, you're not crazy and you're not getting admitted and blah, blah, blah. And she was talking to the um, LCSW that was in the room. And I was talking to the doctor and I said, doctor, I just don't know what to do. Like, I'm scared. I, was, I think I was crying and I was just saying, I don't know what to do. I'm scared she's going to do it. And I don't, I'm like, I need her here. She, I, my daughter needs a mom. I need my wife. Like, and he was just like, listen, things are going to be fine. And I said, well, how do you know that? Like, how do I protect her? And he said, women like her would never commit suicide in a sloppy way. She would never want anybody to remember her not looking her best. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do? And he said, there's only two ways women like her commit suicide. That is asphyxiating them, themselves in the garage <clears throat> using the car or overdosing on pills. She said, as long as you do that, she's safe. I want you to go home. I want you to take the car keys and I want you to take any prescription pills out of the house. And I cannot believe that I was naive enough to believe him. And that's what well, I did. You, of course you were, Stephen. A man with three degrees stood there and said to you, yeah, I'll and tell you what I to do. And you were so home. tired and did it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and she hung herself. And I was just going to say. What the doctor said she could never do. Right in my basement and then strapped my daughter to the changing table before she did it. And who found and, and, and now I have to live with that. My daughter has to live with that. And so, you know, and so then um, another facility we took her to that she was on watch. Like if we called, they knew Alexis, they knew she was a priority, uh, but it was more of a, a crisis center, yeah. a lot of homeless people there, um, you know, and, but we were not too good for that. We pulled up first thing in the morning, 8 a.m. Nobody else was there. We went to check in. It was glass doors at the front and we pulled up and she was chain smoking. She wasn't a smoker, but she was chain smoking throughout all this because she was like, so anxious, uh, so anxious. And she went to the trunk. She grabbed her uh, a cigarette, pack, a pack of cigarettes out of her purse. She was sitting in the parking lot, just shaking and chain smoking. And when she was done, we went to the door. We opened it up, and she said, "I need help. Somebody has to help me." And the lady working the front desk looked at her and said, "You pulled up here in a Mercedes Benz, and you think you have problems?" Oh my God, Stephen! And she said, "Please, I need help. I need help." And she said, go into the waiting room and wait. We sat in the waiting room from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. At 4 p.m., a social worker came back. We talked. Um, and we went through the series of questions. And she asked, you know, are you religious? And she said, well, yes, my father's a minister, and I grew up very religious, and I have faith. And she said, well, that's great. That's, you know, that should be enough for you not to do what you're telling me you're going to do. You know, are you educated? Yes, I'm educated. I, you know, I have a master's degree. Well, that's wonderful. You know, that's another big factor why you won't do it. Um, do you have a supportive husband? Yes, I love my husband. Uh, have you had thoughts of harming your husband or baby? No, I love my husband. I love my baby. I don't want to harm them. I just don't know any other way to make this stop other than, you know, if you send me home, something bad's going to happen. I'm not, I'm going to take She's my life. She's saying it and everywhere. Yes, and, all they did was find reasons why she wouldn't do it. And so I always say, like, what does crazy look like? Is there right. a right way to say you're going to kill yourself? Does it or look a certain you're way? Not crazy? Because to me, if you're a person and you have the strength yeah. to tell professionals and loved yes. ones that you're going to kill yourself, you know, that's serious. Yeah, whenever there, someone says right that, way wrong way. Yeah. it's pretty and, true. And so we met with her at four, at around five. There were four psychologists or psychiatrists on that day and really what we were trying to do was see a psychiatrist because she thought the zoloff that her ob okay. described her was making her have these suicidal thoughts because she was having problems before but she wasn't having suicidal thoughts and they're like 
you, as you know, it's impossible to see a psychiatrist. Yep. And so I kept saying, stay on it. If your doctor prescribed it, you need to be on it. She kept saying, I need to be off them. And so at five o'clock, they said, well, the psychiatrists are leaving for the day and for the weekend. Better luck next week. There'll be four more on on Monday. Yeah, don't get sick on a Friday. But they saw at least probably 20 other people that came in that were homeless people that were, you know, I guess to look at had the appearance or whatever but they just simply didn't see her because of the car we pulled up in and so they sent us and said better luck monday well monday she was dead and so did you ever go back and tell all these fuckers what happened no i never went back but um trust me they know about me and they've changed their policy since then. And that's part of the problem I feel in this area. You know, for the work you do, you're blessed to have a health system that backs you. I'm beyond blessed to have Allegheny Health Network and Highmark. But I feel like for so many health systems, because my story is normal. It happens every day in every city in America. And I, I, and I, and I, I mean, I probably shouldn't say things like this, but from my perspective, and I've been through it, so I think I'm allowed to say it, I think that, for a lot of health systems to fix the problem means to admit there is one and that they're yeah. not doing everything they can for moms. And maybe that's a liability issue, but at the times now they have to change. I was just going to say, and, I mean, there really is just a do the right thing time. And have to. if there's one hospital in Pittsburgh, you and one in New Jersey, me, where are all yeah. these people going because we know they're everywhere everywhere they're everywhere when they, they reach out to me and i i mean if i i have so many messages every day from different areas of the country saying please help us do a system like this or how do i get you know oftentimes it's male executives to understand and i always tell them like these guys everyone on earth had a mother at some point yep. that's like this is the i call it common sense medicine like how can you deny women this kind of care it's when when I met with the hospital executives, um, it was all men. And yeah. I did the same exact thing. I'm like, you all came from a mother. And maybe you have a wife. Maybe you have a daughter. And uh, I, I just said, I'm telling you, just because you haven't had someone complete suicide yet or know about it, it's coming. So until you Without get ahead of it. I know. Sorry, I have to plug my oh, phone Steven. in. Um, plug your phone in. I mean... Um, Oh, I just, as many times as I hear, I just always hear something else new. And I just am sorry for the whole health system failing you and Alexa so much. And it always just really hurts. Um, it's just horrible that everybody failed you and you asked all the right things. It's, it's, it's pathetic is what it is. It's pathetic. It is. Um, it's and, and so, and so basically you know, we just kept reaching out and reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. And, and, and I have a huge problem with OBs being, and it's not their fault because they don't have anyone else. So they, they don't. Start doing other doctors' jobs. And yep. they get tasked with prescribing meds that they, quite frankly, just don't know that much about. And so in our case, my wife was prescribed Zoloft. And when she started having suicidal thoughts, she called her OB. She went back in and she said, listen, like I'm having these horrible thoughts on this stuff. I really don't think I should be on it. And the doctor said, no, no, no. It's going to take two to three weeks to kick in. And she doubled the dose. <gasps> and and she didn't say to her, you know, often this medicine, this type of medicine increases anxiety before you feel better. Right. And that they screen for family history of mental illness. Um, had they done anything right? Mm -hmm. They would have known she should have never been on that medication. And that's one of the big things that, and it was such an easy fix yeah. for Allegheny Health Network. I don't know if it was easy, but they did it so quickly. They did it within, I think, a week of the first time I ever met with them. They screened <laughs> using the Edinburgh scale and the MDQ. <laughs> yep. So the doctors know if there's a family history of certain things, uh, especially bipolar, there's certain meds you can't be right. on. Yep. And it's not because the state mandates it. They did it because it's the right thing. And it's a quick, easy fix. Yep. And so if they did it so quickly, why can't other health systems? Exactly. Why and can't there be one? You have OBs in your health system prescribing these meds. Shouldn't we give them the tools they need to safely prescribe? Yep. 
you know, Shouldn't they and, be educated. It's really not their fault. They don't know. And if they're the only ones that moms are reaching out to, you're in Pittsburgh. It's a city. Right. Right. And then, what about? And OB that missed the delivery is also the one that prescribed her the medicine. And I have a real problem with her. Um, but you can't go back. I hope she at least, I hope she's more vigilant now than she was with my wife. Um, <laughs> And so I'm, sure I, I, I'm trying to think where I'm losing my train of thought. Um, you know what I'm going to tell you? There's a, a uh, mom on here for my program. Her name is Allison. I don't know if you can see her yeah. brother um, lost his wife to completed suicide. How long ago, Allison? Three years. Um, she's here in New Jersey with me and she's just saying how much she wishes she could get her brother to talk to you. Yeah. You know, Cause he lost his wife too. So and people don't realize how common it is. Yeah. And and we, you know, it's kind of funny. Yesterday, the picture of my wife popped up on my feed and it was from Mom Congress. Oh, and with the baby, yeah. Right? Yeah, the first, Alexis, last one. Yep. That was Alexis looking over over Adriana, and that was mm -hmm. the last picture ever taken of her. And that was the picture I took to send to her parents to say she's gonna be okay. And earlier that day, I had to go to work. My mother, and she loved our dog, Lucy, so much. Like, if everywhere she went, it was like, if I had to do something, we had to find child care and dog care for our dog. <laughs> I had to find other people to help. It was 24, it was suicide watch from family and loved ones around Alexis. And then she's like, everyone thinks I'm crazy. Everyone's going to think I'm crazy forever. And... I was like, no, everyone loves you. They just don't want to see anything bad happen. And she went back to the same OB. And our the first doctor that gave her the anxiety stuff, you know, said, listen, like what that doctor did in the delivery room to you is not okay. And you need to tell her. And so she went to that appointment that day. And she told her, why were, did you miss the delivery of my baby? And it's kind of funny. Like I come from a restaurant background. If I don't, if I don't send someone their food or it's two hours late, they don't get paid. Right. That doctor got paid every dollar for a delivery that she did not participate in. Yep. I wasn't even there for that. Yeah. Well, I have a problem with the way she came in and put it on miss. you. Right. I should get the money for that and split it with the nurse. Um, joke. But she got paid for a job she didn't do. That, that And also, by she applied the first trauma. Right. She's the reason. And then for sent it down. She is the reason for this. I know. And I'm, I'm still so pissed off. You should um, be. And so, you know, her last doctor's appointment she ever went to, she went and she was tasked with putting this doctor in her place. Well, she told her, why did you miss it? And she said she was not happy. The doctor? And my wife was looking into alternative... Um, things that she could do for someone's at my door. Like if I don't eat, <laughs> um, hold on a UPS. Okay. Look, <laughs> I'll, show, I'll show everybody my dog that stays on top of me all day. This girl, right? All day. Um, so hold on. They got to pick something up. Um, it's okay. Um, We're all in terrible. real life right now. But, um, yeah. It only there makes, is, it only um, makes it better. <laughs> So anyway, so she left that appointment. So she did talk to her. She talked to her. She put her in her place. But when my wife talked about, you know, like having more children, what's she going to do? How is she going to get through this? And the doctor basically said, um, you're not cut out for this. Oh, my go God. On, go, she go still has control. a license. And do not have any more babies. That was the advice she gave her. Yeah. Hold on one second. Okay. There's these two boxes here, but. I only have one. You have one? What's it for? I hope it's a box of wine. Is there any way we could do this another time? Uh, I have to leave it. Um, I have to take it to a. You know what? Does anyone have? Go ahead, Stephen. Does anyone have any questions? Or I know I can't I have two minutes. How hard Sorry, this is. This You're okay. Timing. You're okay. 
Um, if anyone has any questions or any uh, ideas or any comments to make, and I um, do understand, and I'm sorry I didn't say trigger warning first. I know, Allison. I know. Um, that, you know, this is hard to hear, but um, we can do hard things. And by hearing this and by hearing it from uh, Stephen and what he's done, um, which he'll get into now too, you know, uh, we can, we can make it through and, um, he doesn't want anyone else to have to go through this. And it's supposed to be both of those. Oh, I didn't know that Elizabeth. It's really a small world. That's gotta be something else. Then don't worry about it. Huh? That's gotta be 100 pounds, huh? Yeah. At least, we, at least we know UPS is still working. Yeah. Okay. I'm doing a live thing right now. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, just call them and they'll figure it out. All right. Thanks. All right. Sorry about that. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, so is that anyway, Elise still yeah, practicing? She, she, um, yeah, she told her that she wasn't cut out for to be a mother and that she shouldn't have any more children and to just go on birth control. And... I remember my mom took her to the appointment. I picked her up. And when I picked her up, it was like, it was like every worry in the world. Her anxiety was gone. Breathing smooth. Hmm. Like, oh my goodness, what happened in there? Like, that's that I am. And I said, well, wh what happened? She said, I just, I know what I have to do now. And I oh, said, no. I said, what's that? She said, I'm just thinking too far down the road. I just have to, you know, stay in the moment um, and not think long term. And I said, because she was worrying about everything. Like we had just built this beautiful townhouse and she's like, but Adriana needs a real house to live on and a nice street. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you promised me we're going to get home. And we had a, it was a, so I said, yes, yeah, if you want a house, buy a house. And then, you know, it was like, and we have to, we have to start eating healthier. We have to use. It was everything. Right. Which we see with so many moms too. Like the anxiety just spins out and the racing thoughts and you just are thinking of everything. You're frozen, but if you're moving, walk away. Christina, can we send her letters? Now you're back. That it was going to be, that it was going to be over soon, and that unfortunately, um, that doctor caused her, her PTSD, prescribed her the medicine, and really just crushed her at that last appointment. Um, and I have a problem because she's still a doctor. I, that's what I wanted she to know. So she's still and, there. Oh, she packed her bags, got out of Pittsburgh, and moved to another city right away as soon as it happened. But um, should someone like that really be a doctor of some sort? I don't think so. Um, but that's, you know, I can't do anything about that. I but um, I just, it just oh, it burns oh, me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and then... Um, so she was not like most women in that she knew she was in trouble. She sought help. She begged and pleaded for help. And she was willing to do whatever it took. And so it was, you know, she spent two and a half days in intensive care before she passed. And it was like, oh, it was so horrible. Um, and my best friend's dad is a doctor at the hospital, a neurologist, where we first went. And as soon as we got there, I could imagine it was kind of like, here's this woman that just hung herself in her basement. There were people everywhere and my whole family w was there. And coincidentally, we passed some of my best friends were in a car and they saw my whole family's car pulling into the hospital. So they pulled in and they life flighted her from that hospital down to the city and when I got there, my best friend's dad, who's the neurologist, he kind of, he just said, listen, before you go in there, she was in ICU, 
He said, I don't want to, I don't want you to get your hopes up because she's not going to make it. Her neck's broken. Um, and there's no way she's going to make it at this point. They're just gonna, they're going to keep her, you know, here as long as possible so that her friends, her family can come in from Florida and New Jersey. And, but just, she's not going to make it. And I remember seeing her in that room. I mean, it was terrible. Um, but I was never mad at her. It was never like anger towards her. It was towards the health system. And my heart still was just so broken for her because I know how hard she fought. I know, I mean, I've had anxiety since it happened. I know that horrible feeling. Uh, and I know how hard it is for to admit you're having these thoughts um, and to desperately beg for help and to always just go home. Um, it's just not fair for anybody. I don't care if it's if you're a, a child, a grown man, whatever. If you're having a mental health problem and you need help, you should get the help you deserve. And you know, I always liken it to if your wife got diagnosed with breast cancer, or you were, and you went to the hospital, and you said, and they said, you know, we we ran tests. You know, you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, but unfortunately, we don't offer services for breast cancer, mind you. Two women, two times as many women this year will be diagnosed with a perinatal mental health or mood disorder yep. versus breast cancer. And we hear about breast cancer every day, all day, every and day. there's huge funds for it. And if you got turned away as a husband, you know, when they turned her away, I took her home. But if she had breast cancer and they said we don't offer services like that, I would have been in there like a psychopath flipping out for her to get the treatment. What do you mean you don't offer it? Yep. And for some reason in this country, it's become acceptable to not offer this kind of care. Yep. And so that's why I do what I do now, because it's not acceptable. And I want people to fight, even if it's not the dad. Anyone that loves a woman going through something like this, you need to fight with the health system. And you need to demand that they get the help, that they get treated the same way they would if it was a physical illness. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and that's a huge, beautiful, important message like get mad there's get no mad. there's no physical health if we don't have our mental health and there's no damn reason that you shouldn't have all these things in place as much as you have mammograms technicians and well, all the doctors when your mental health fails then you have all the physical problems that happen yep yeah your body falls apart if you're sick mentally because it just keeps your 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 just your body keeps trying to get you to help so if the anxiety isn't working, we're going to raise your heart rate. We're going to make you smoke. We're going to make you not sleep and make you seek or help. Or people start drinking. Or, yep. or people get different fibromyalgia, different things like that from all the yep. stress and everything. Yep. I mean, it wreaks havoc, havoc on your whole body for years after. Yep. And, and it has on mine just from all the grief and everything. So, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I know from firsthand what it does. And I always say, like, what's the true cost of this? Mm -hmm. well, because my wife's case, I think, 800 plus thousand for the life flight, the two and a half days in intensive care and back to the intensive care. Not, well, not to mention four times I went to the ER with panic attacks because if something happens to me, my daughter has no yeah. parents, Yep. you yep. know, and her mother, the, the, the problem she's had since she passed away, friends and family, you know, especially people getting pregnant that we knew that are hypervigilant, which is a good thing. Right. They've got doctors, but they're affected. Yep. Good because they're worried. Um, so in my daughter, child psychology appointments weekly for over a year now, you know, what's the true cost of just this one story? Yep. And Isn't how it, many stories are there? And how about the fact that we in America may know at some point this year because of the new bill, right? Saying that we want to know who has a uh, completed or attempted suicide if you're a new mom after delivery right. no one even has those statistics because well, it's funny I, and i think hospitals have been covering it up forever mm -hmm. so they found out that you know if a woman dies within i think 42 days of giving birth yes it's exactly 42 system. yep yeah, there's a box on the yep. death certificate that they have to check 
Mm -hmm. And that goes into the maternal mortality rate, which is yep. higher here, grotesquely higher than any other developed nation in the entire world. In the greatest country in the world, women yep. are, it's the leading cause. And we have the highest number. Suicide. Yep. And, and what it does, is, it doesn't babies. even take into account anyone. How many times have you, because of, 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 a, of a Lexus, heard of another woman or another family, right? Uh, I could walk into an open house, I still remember, and it was a realtor. I, I don't, she just asked me where I worked, and I told her. And uh, she said, I think I lost my best friend to that 40 years ago. Yeah. A Lexus didn't even count in the maternal mortality. And that really pisses me off. Yeah. All the work we've done, all the fighting for this exact cause. Her death certificate, you know what it says? Accident. Hangs herself. That's what her cause of death is. It doesn't say she had a mental health issue. And my daughter has to see that when she plays sports, when she does anything, because I'm a single parent. When she gets a passport, I have to show her death certificate for more stuff than I ever imagined. And she can read now. Is that really why she died? Because she hung herself? Or why did she hang herself? And then the box for for being having a baby within 42 days, that was never checked. Nope. And I think the hot health systems, you know, and maybe the coroner, they work together to keep those stats hidden. And so, I don't even, I don't think that they even wanted to keep them. Exactly. Because they didn't want to know. Because when you know, it's a shame on you if you don't do something, right? Well, if you're a health system and you deliver babies and you have a 2% maternal mortality rate, are you really going to deliver there? I don't know. I could be speculating on all this, but that's just my, that was my real life. That's reality for me. Yeah. And my wife didn't even get counted. And that pisses me off. And I will rectify that eventually. Well, Stephen, you're getting her counted every day. You've been getting her counted ever since I met you four years ago. Right. Every no, day. but I want it official. And I want it oh, more. Oh, yeah. I, I would too. Her, and I want her death certificate changed, but I'm digressing here. So, so no, anyway. I think there, I think this thing turns us off in seven minutes. So I want to, and thank you. Okay, I so want to, I want you to tell everybody else. what you do now. How so you build this? I'm going to speed up. So we built this, and I'll give you a story, a backstory of how I came up with the idea for it while she was in intensive care another time. But so it's like everything in life. You don't realize there's a need for something until you need it and it's not exactly. there. And so after she died, it was abundantly clear something needed to be done. And I had this idea of building mother baby units or one. Um, and it was really hard to get a health system to listen. And they all said, it's impossible, it'll never happen. And then I had a meeting with people from Highmark and HN and it was two women, myself and my sister. And they said, we're gonna do this. As a matter of fact, they were well off. They had long careers. They were, you know, ready to retire. And, and this program kind of, there was electric through the whole hospital. You've been there, but d during oh, yeah. the process. And we had everyone from every area of medicine to the janitors that were saying, how can we help out? We had weekly meetings every Friday and everyone wanted to participate in one way or another. And it just re it just gave everyone the passion to go back to work. And it gave these doctors that worked in women's health and, you know, psychiatry, psychology, um, OBs kind of a renewed energy and a way to leave an impact. I was just going to say part on healthcare and everyone yep. poured so much heart and soul into it. And so we operated out of temporary space. And then we finally in December 2018 opened you know, this multi-million dollar, two and a half facility, uh, 7,300 square foot facility, which you've seen, yep. which is absolutely amazing. The, the thought that- For mother and babies. For mothers and babies and fathers. Right. And we have a chef's demo kitchen. We do yoga, mindfulness, mother, baby, infant massage, art therapy, group therapy, uh, individual therapy. I mean, all this amazing, amazing stuff. We have a large group room, medium room. And I think we're, I, I mean, in the beginning, there was Becky Weinberg and then Sarah Hermitsky came on yes, and Sarah. Like a small crew. And I think right now we're up to 26, I think 26 employees oh. um, with plans to the, 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 the program was designed to be easily replicable. Right. And I don't know how, you know, this pandemic's going to hurt, but you know, we have plans to open three more facilities in the region later this year. And then I, my dream is that if we can quantify it and it, and I know the numbers add up, 
They just have to. Um, you know, if we can get a region locked down, I hope to one day eventually offer these services to the women world, the country. Um, that's the ultimate goal. So, I, and, I, and I and I know we'll get it done. I know we will. I do too. I do and too. So, you know, that's kind of it. And so it's kind of ironic that, um, you know, right now I think yesterday or in this past weekend we should have been in DC for Mom Congress. Yeah, we would have been and all this week. We yeah, and here we are, you know, making the best of of this situation, which I think is a good way to live your life, to always just try to make the best of it. Um, yep. And and I can't tell you how rewarding this work has been for me, and it's my therapy, and it keeps me connected to my wife every day. You know, they always say, like, you get married when you meet a woman that makes you a better person. Um, and I hate, like, till death do us part, because I don't think that just because someone's here, you're not connected still. Um, I also think for most, you know, from somebody that lost the love of their life, I think, and I hate more than anything, is when people say, you know, marriage is 50-50. Because marriage is not 50-50. It's got to be 100 and 100. If you all give it your all, things are going to be fine. And, and so sometimes you're the only one giving it your all because right. that's, your, that's your person, right? Yeah. And, 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 and if she's down, then you're up. Able to, and they're going to lift you up. And so, you know, if you have your loved one with you, like, don't worry about the bullshit. Love each other. Um, give it your all. Things are going to be fine. Um, and fight for each other. Always stand up for each other. So I know this pandemic is kind of an awkward time, especially for me now. It's like, I'm like, oh, man, uh, you know, I can only imagine how different it would be if I had her here with me in this house. I'm like so sick and tired of doing everything. Everything. <laughs> it's oh, hard. Man. It's I know. Really hard. Um, what would you say to, um, I see their dads here. What would you say well, to dads? So here's my advice for dads quickly. Like, I think you can learn a lot by watching someone's eating habits. Alexis lost 50 pounds in five and a half weeks. Watch uh, how they eat. Um, tell your friends and family that you need help. You know, they want to help. Right. You know, and if they want to help, tell them, don't ask for help. Just come do it. Right. Don't ask me to ask you. Come help with the baby. Take the baby. I agree. Shower. Let them know, like, don't, women shouldn't have to be forced to ask for help. Because we can't. should help. Um, you always let her know that she's needed and she's doing a good job. Let them know that there's never a situation where you're better off without them. Let them know, even if they are going through something and you're putting like 150% in and she's doing 25, that they're not a burden. Um, big thing is breastfeeding. Oh, yeah. Shit, breastfeeding's hard. If you have to give your baby a bottle, they will be just fine. Just My fine. Parents, the 99th percentile for health, for height, weight, never has, never gets sick. Nothing's you know, more important five, than the five, mother's five, mental health. So, bottle. and guess what? She cried nonstop. Her first bottle, she was a new baby. She was the best baby in the world after she got formula. So, um, Listen to what your wife's saying. If something sounds off, that means it is. Or if you have a feeling, health, too. You know, I think it's hard for people to decipher that when someone's sick mentally, they might look and sound like the same person you exactly. know. Exactly. They are not. So it's important to really digest and listen to what they're saying. Um, decision making. If they're having a hard time making decisions, like, Oh my God, I have to brush my teeth and comb my hair. What am I going to wear? What are we going to do? We need to do this. And we need yep. and can't make up their mind on anything. There's a yep. problem. All right. Um, I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. Where can people to donate to help you? Huh? Where can people reach you or donate to help you? And I will put it on our website. Go ahead. Uh, tell me. www.alexisjoyfoundation.org. Um, and if you can, please post your hashtag, my wish for moms. That's right. Uh, it's We've one, been putting it on everything. Chrissy Teigen did the thing with us. Um, and I want to see men share their wish for moms and even children. Everybody should have a wish for their moms because all moms deserve more than what they're getting right now. Um, and I, and I, men are going to step up. I know we are. I and know you are. Hashtag stand up, man up. It's time to change the way stuff's done. We need oh, I love that one. I love that one. Yeah, so, We're going to give you a whole station of men to take over. Okay. Yeah, and if there's any men listening that want to step up and do more, um, Facebook me. And Perfect. let's get a group of guys that are going to, like, change the game. That's what I want. I'm going to put all your information down. I love you. You're fantastic. I, you I can't wait to see you in person again. Um, it rips my heart open, but I'm so glad. 
I'm so glad you're here. Girls. I love you. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye, honey. Stay safe, everyone.